jobs, fracking, pension reform, liquor, judges, and the Pennsylvania state budget. We have it all with State Representative Carrie Benninghoff. A new edition of WHVL's For the Record starts right now. Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got to develop a product that you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Good morning and welcome to this edition of For the Record. Joining us this morning is the representative from the 171st District in Pennsylvania, Representative Kerry Benninghoff. Representative, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you having us. Mr. Benninghoff, let's get started with the economy. That's always a hot topic no matter what time of the year we're in. And Governor Rick Scott from Florida, a couple weeks ago, made the trek up to Pennsylvania, said he was going to steal Pennsylvanians' jobs. Uh, businesses away from Pennsylvania and therefore jobs. You responded with a little bit of a mini tour and a tour that's going to go on statewide hosting, talking to business executives about what we have to do to keep those jobs in Pennsylvania. How did that go? Uh, very good. Actually, we got some great information. Part of the goal of the House Policy Committee is to not only learn what we can do better in the Commonwealth, but to learn things that we are doing well. As you may not know, at the end of this year, we will be finally phasing out the capital stock and franchise tax. Pennsylvania is plagued with the fact of being one of two states that still does two uh, taxes on business, we call a dual tax state. And that makes us very unattractive for businesses that are looking to come to Pennsylvania. They see that uh, getting taxed on the corporate level twice, they don't even look at it a second time. So we're very excited about trying to phase that out. Finally, that stopped, started under Governor Ridge, and we hope uh, that Governor Wolf will fall lead and allow that to phase out at the end of this year. Now, you are the chairman of the House Majority Policy Committee. Correct. What exactly does that committee do besides, you know, figure out where th the pretty much the traffic hop of being in the House? Well, there are voting committees called standing committees, which I am not. The policy committee does not take a vote, but we have official members. I call them deputy chairs, and we travel throughout the state trying to be fact finders, gathering information, uh, promoting policy that maybe our caucus is moving on, uh, counterbalancing policy that we may not necessarily agree with in the minority party. Uh, but for the most part, we are trying to better educate the public about what is going on in the state legislature, uh, better uh, attract uh, ideas from them, because really the reality is not all legislation comes from a legislator. Sometimes it's suggestions by people who work in the manufacturing world or work in the teaching world or have had to apply one of our state statutes that just aren't effective anymore. And it is important for us to talk to those people that are on the front lines. When you were talking to the business leaders, did you get a sense that they even took the governor seriously when he was up here? Well, it wasn't a matter of being as fearful about what Governor Scott was doing. They were more concerned about uh, a proposed budget that was coming out of our own governor and the idea of raising taxes significantly. A lot of the businesses in Pennsylvania are not major corporations. They're small subchapter S corporations, uh, pardon me, businesses that pay a personal income tax and not a corporate net income tax. And they are very concerned when you raise the personal income tax, it's not just on individuals, but on their businesses. And any increased cost means less employees that they can hire and less pay raises they can give to their current employees. And they look at that as a deterrent to growing their own businesses domestically. Diving into Governor Wolf's proposed budget a little bit, what were some of the things that you may have liked that were in the budget? And what were some of those things you were just like, whoa, the, yeah, not at all? Well, I think Governor Wolf is trying to be a little bit energizing for Pennsylvania. As we know, he served as a former Secretary of Budget. Now, two of the things that I liked best in the budget was the fact that he's looking to lower the corporate net income tax and hold true to our capital stock and franchise phase out. Uh, that's a very strong message, hopefully counterbalance something like Governor Scott is trying to do in mining jobs out of Pennsylvania. It's also attractive to trying to bring other businesses here in Pennsylvania. The, um, how do you see currently the state of business in Pennsylvania as if no changes were to happen? Well, I have never subscribed to the thought that because July 1 rolls in, you automatically have to spend more money than you did on June 30th. Uh, budgeting is one of the biggest things we have to do on an annual basis. Uh, the numbers are better than they had been, and we're anticipating the end of year revenues to probably be about $1.3 billion down. A uh, billion dollars is a lot of money. I know the governor's administration is talking about 2.3. Uh, I think they're off on that, and I'm glad that it's a billion dollars less. That said, I really think we can start from last year's budget as a baseline, make whatever adjustments we need to in there to address fixed costs, debt servicing, and those demands on us, whether it's increased in employee health care costs, and still meet the June 30th deadline. To be raising all types of different taxes in order to have more money to spend is an issue of choice. I believe we can pass a responsible budget, 
uh, fund those organizations and entities that we appropriate money to without having to raise the taxpayers on individuals. You mentioned that there was more money to, you expect more money to be able to be sent this year than in previous years. I'm guessing that the transportation bill and the increase in the gas tax had something to do with that. Pennsylvania now has one of the highest gas taxes in the country. When gas prices were down close to $2 a gallon, Pennsylvania was still upwards of two twenty dollars average price per gallon. Any, you know, uh, fire back from that and maybe you, in the future we'll be looking to maybe peel that back a little bit? Uh, two things I'd say is number one, the liquid fuels tax is different than our general budget. Our general budget uh, deals with other different taxes. Uh, the taxes that we raise in order to fund our roads, bridges, highways, railways, and air uh, ports is done through liquid fuels taxes. You and I who utilize the commodity pay the price. Uh, we pay tire taxes and things, but that's separate offline from the state budget. Uh, the reality is we haven't got a lot of pushback on it. Granted, prices have been down uh, significantly from the almost $4 that they were several years ago. But I also think that we sent a message out across Pennsylvania and said, you know, we have to pay the piper if we want to have quality roads. One of the things that people don't realize is we have about 43,000 miles of roadway to take care of, about 25,000 bridges. And out of those 25,000 bridges, we try to repair or replace 300 of those a year. That's a lot of work, a lot of money. It is a price we pay for the beautiful valleys, ridges, and streams that we have here in Pennsylvania, which is unique compared to some of our neighboring states. You drop over the border and drop into Maryland, it gets pretty flat. They have sand-based uh, topography where we have limestone. For us to put a bridge structure in, we have to do a lot of blasting and digging, and it's not that easy to do. But the reality is I think the former Secretary of Transportation, Barry Shoak, did a good job getting the message across. There has been no increase in 18 years, and if you want smoother quality roads, we have to do this. And it is those people using it will pay the price. That's separate from the state budget. So to, to repeal that back, I think, becomes antiquated and does not help uh, really get us where we want to be. People need to understand a good quality transportation system, both railway, airports, roads, and bridges, is also part about building a strong economy and uh, getting people's goods and services to the market all across the country. It's definitely a complicated issue in terms of what you're paying for taxes what, right. and where that tax money's actually going. And coming up on For the Record, we'll get into shale gas, we'll get into public pension, and of course, we're going to talk liquor. Stay with us, you are watching WHVL's For the Record. Welcome back to For the Record. Joining us in the studio, Representative Kerry Benninghoff and Representative wanted to talk about shale gas. It's always a hot topic environmentalists with against fracking you're either for it you're against it there's a couple new re regulations coming out with it but the shale gas severance tax and impact fee how what's what's the difference for the state well first of all fracking is a process that we have been using here in the state of pennsylvania for over 75 years out in the western parts of the state and some of the shallow wells they have been using this process it basically allows us to fracture the rocks to release the gas the difference now is we're doing it with a lot more oversight and regulations. Uh, every well site that's drilled has to have six layers of protection, three layers of concrete, three layers of steel. That is generally down a mile below the water level. And so we are being very environmentally friendly about this. But the reality is we are all benefactors already. People don't realize that some of the electricity they use on a day-to-day -day basis is produced by natural gas. It's produced better, faster, cleaner by using natural gas in the old days when we use coal, which we still use a lot of coal for that as well. So I think as consumers, we need to decide, do we want to still keep our house at 72 degrees? We still want to enjoy air conditioning? Because at the end of the day, we have to have some kind of energy source to do that. And more importantly, do we want to pay Americans, Pennsylvanians to harvest what we have? Or do we want to pay Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Russia, and other countries who may not be as friendly to the United States? For me, that's the bottom line. Several years ago, my finance committee, we passed something called the impact fee. Uh, it is a tax on the gas industries. Whether you want to call it a fee or not, Governor Corbett preferred to call it a fee versus a tax, but it is a tax that equates to about 3% uh, on the production of the natural gas. But more importantly, through the travels we did across the Commonwealth, many of the local communities said, if you're going to put a tax on there, we want something that's going to be local. We want to get some reimbursement local. And so through that local impact fee tax, uh, the money stayed in the local communities in addition to some of the money going into Harrisburg. We were able to replenish a fund called the Capital, pardon me, the uh, Hazardous Waste Cleanup Fund, and that was a fund that was going to sunset in 2014, and that was actually cleaning up coal waste. 
had nothing to do with the natural gas industry, but they agreed to put millions of dollars into this fund, and it'll continue in perpetuity. The impact fee is a locally assessed fee to try to help offset any infractions on the roads or in the natural environment. But the reality is we regulate these companies tremendously because we want to have a safe environment. We can, through today's technology, harvest fuel smart and safe at the same time. As you know, the current administration wants to put something called a severance tax, which has been done in some other states in addition to this. Under Act 13, if they impose a severance tax, which I call an energy tax, it's taxing your energy, it repeals the impact fee. In the local communities, many of our townships and boroughs around here will no longer get that money. It's automatically repealed. That's going to be a negative impact on their budgets, what they depend on that for a lot of local projects. What it would be the issues with maybe taking the impact fee, it's at 3% now, and maybe boosting it, to say, to maybe 35 maybe 4.5% to get some more money into the local economies. Is there any pushback from the industry on that? Well, I think you have to decide why do you want to tax the industry additionally. Uh, there are others who will argue, is it fair to tax one industry because they're extracting something out of the ground. You know, we currently don't tax people to extract, if you're going to call it an extraction tax, uh, to extract sand, water, oil, or other commodities that are naturally given. Uh, for some, it's just a new pool of money, and it goes back to the earlier dialogue you and I have had. If it's about taxing somebody else just to get more money to spend, I'm not sure if that's necessarily fair. You can always justify uh, finding a way to tax someone other than yourself to pay for things you want. I personally like to govern on the lines of government staying within their means, not spending more than what they need. This administration wants to tax them more so they have more money to spend. You're talking about increasing a state budget by almost $5 billion by raising personal income tax, sales tax, and imposing a Marcellus shale tax. I'm not sure if that says to people who are looking to come to Pennsylvania that you're a tax-friendly state. The, uh, you mentioned uh, the coal industry in Pennsylvania. We've had member of the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, the director right. John Pippi mm -hmm. on here. What do you think of President Obama's EPA regulations that uh, essentially could put the coal industry out of business in Pennsylvania? I think that's taken a lot of hard working people's jobs away. I think these are people that help build America. Whether you like coal or not, the reality is it's a cheap energy source that allows us to produce energy and electricity much cheaper. We have better scrubbers and cleaners than we've ever had in these power plants that use this stuff, and we are being much more environmentally protective both in the burning and the extraction of this material. The reality is the United States is shipping about 25% of their coal production to China. China has zero regulations on this stuff, and they burn it up right and left. There is no natural or artificial barrier between the borders of Japan and the rest of the world that's going to keep their pollution located just in their own country. We as a country have got to decide whether we're not going to be energy independent and in depend on our own resources or we're going to depend on countries, many of which who hate us. Governor Corbett never responded with a plan to the EPA regulations. What is the state's plan currently right now and, and how is the legislator, legislative going to go out, out and say to the EPA, no, you can't do that, do this within our state? Well, I think you're going to have some conflict there. Obviously, you've got an administration, a Democrat uh, executive office who may believe one way. Uh, I think the Republican-controlled House and Republican-controlled uh, Senate believe that we want to have comp co free competition, whether it's through wind, solar, uh, nuclear, coal, oil, whatever type of resource. You've got to have a multifaceted portfolio. Not one of those resources are going to meet the energy needs unless we as Pennsylvanians are willing to dramatically curtail our utilization of energy. Well, as prices have gone up and down, we've seen that people do not diminish their own utilization very much. People like the comforts of air conditioning. We've got generations who have never done without air conditioning. They live in it, they get in their car with air conditioning, they go to school, work in air conditioning, and they crawl right back into it when they go back home. The reality is we can do it better and smarter. I think it's about putting a smart energy portfolio together and in putting additional energy taxes on any company, your listeners need to understand that's an energy tax on you. Companies don't pay the tax directly. It's all passed on to consumers, just like any other product that's sold. Doing it better and smarter, we could say that about a lot of things. Uh, two, two of those things are pension reform Absolutely. and liquor in the state. And I know we can't cover all this in, in a 30-minute show, but let's just dive into pension a little bit. Well, the reality is the pension system for government employees was generally a little bit better than what the average person saw in the private sector many years ago when government salaries were not as uh, competitive. Uh, today, government salaries are pretty competitive, actually pretty lucrative, 
in addition to a good type of pension. The reality is we cannot be doing a 21st, 20th century model in the 21st century. Pension reform sure to be a hot topic. We'll get into that a little bit later on for the record. We'll also get into liquor bills that are in the Senate and in the House as well. And we'll talk about a project that Representative Benninghoff is very dear to his heart. You're watching WHBL's For the Record. Welcome back to WHVL's For the Record. State Representative Kerry Benninghoff in the studio. We're about to continue with our topic about pension reform and Representative Benninghoff. That, that's such a, a topic. One of the things that people always say is, well, shrink, shrink the state government. Get rid of some of the senators, get rid of some of the representatives, and, that, and that'll cause anything. But it, it, it's deeper than that. That might be a step, but there's a lot more levels to it. I, and I have no problem with that. As you know, former Speaker Sam Smith had put several bills in to reduce the size of the legislature. Ironically, as you and I talked off camera, at one time the legislature, the House, was actually larger. But you're talking about 253 employees, whether the senators or House members. We need to be consolidating state government in general. Uh, and the House Republicans have tried to do that significant in the last several years. We've reduced our own payroll by millions of dollars. Uh, we took some of the outside services and printing and some other things and, and brought them in-house. We're trying to not be backfilling jobs when we don't need to. But I believe government at all levels has a responsibility to reduce our costs and try to be as efficient as possible. Bottom line, whether it's schools, whether it's local government or county or federal or state, it's all taxpayer money. Government never spends a, money, a dollar they don't take from you first. So, you know, the pensions is one area of that, but the reality, our state budget, less than 1% of the entire state budget is the legislature. So we'd have to look all across the board. I know you guys take the majority of the heat when it comes to this topic, but there is a level of government that is kind of shielded that I, I just don't think the public knows a lot about, and that is the judicial branch. Correct. What is their you know, total costs on the pension reform and, and things like that? Well, the reality is there's 253 legislators and there's hundreds and hundreds of judges all across the Commonwealth. And so they have a larger multiplier. They have the highest in the state, as you know, through the Act 9 rollback that we did trying to reduce some of the costs in our first step at pension reform. Uh, the multiplier was removed from 2.5% back to 2%. Uh, the judges stay at 4 So they get two times uh, as much of a pension multiplier at the time of their retirement. If they, re if they work 10 years, they get 40% of their income. Uh, so we need collectively to be looking at all aspects of government. I think they need to be participatory. Unfortunately, former Supreme Court justices have ruled that they are exempt and that they can't be part of any reform, which I think is silly. Uh, and they use the disguise of being while still in service. Well, I believe anytime you're up for re-election, you are in a member elect, whether judge or a house member, and that would be a time that you could do that. And for any new employees, whether elected judges or elected person at PennDOT or whatever else, we have to go prospectively forward under a new system. The DB system is going to sink under its own weight, and it's not fair to those people that are not in the public sector uh, retirement system because they have to pay more to put in their own retirement system and to subsidize ours. That's not fair. There's problems with the judges here in Center County, whether it has to be dealing with maybe a forged signature on a uh, document, whether it has to be dealing with the right to know. Here I have your memorandum that you sent to all House members about the Right to Know Act, and that actually has to do with stuff going on with the bench, and that's the right to know for jurors who are on high profile cases, maybe such as the Sandusky case, that their information should not be privy to the public. Yeah, my basically is trying to protect the duty of a juror and actually the privacy of their names and their addresses being let out. I think it's important that we get people to serve on a jury and some people have done it and others have find reasons not to do it. I think all of us want to have a fair trial so we ought to all be willing to serve. But people should not have to be frightened with today's technology that their name and address may be left out. And I specifically don't think the government should be supplying that. And so if people are honest and want to serve as a juror, they should have that protection. So I've introduced that bill. That doesn't have anything to do with some of the things going on here in Center County, but it would affect county jurors. Uh, and ironically, a thought came in my mind when I got selected for jury duty, and across the room was my daughter who also got selected for jury duty, and I got tossed out twice, and she was kept for two different uh, court cases. And I thought about that, you know. Everybody sits on the jury as somebody's daughter, brother, son, and I think we as the government owe the protection to protect their privacy of their names and addresses. In a little bit of personal opinion, how frustrating is it for you uh, being a representative and then seeing lawsuits against judges or motions constantly going saying 
this judge failed to do this at a lower level, and then the higher court overturns it. It seems like that's happening more and more often, not just in Pennsylvania, but all across the country. Well, I don't like the lawsuit issues against each other, and I like, don't like that as a taxpayer, because anybody that works in government that sues their government body that they work for is suing the taxpayers. And so you've got one taxpayer, probably one public official who's suing another one, and at the end of the day, the losers there is a taxpayer, because they've got to pay for both lawsuits, and I think that's ridiculous, and just not a good, efficient way of spending taxpayer money. I did want to bring up one thing before we ran out of time. You have started the Cancer Caucus yes. in, the, in the State House. Just tell us a little bit about that. Now, the reality is it's a bicameral uh, function. I have it between the House and the Senate. It's more effective in the Senate House currently. And the goal is to educate our members about some of the services and breakthroughs in technology and therapies that are going here on the Commonwealth. We meet on a quarterly basis. We've traveled to Penn University to learn a little bit more about our T-cell therapy that they're doing uh, as a breakthrough in cancer treatment. And I think as policymakers, we need to be better educated because we are voting sometimes on appropriations that help uh, these medical schools, these uh, teaching schools, and these hospitals. And we're very blessed in this state to have tremendous uh, facilities, and we need to be better educated about it. So we are doing our best through the Cancer Caucus to do that. Sounds like a great, uh, a, a great thing that you guys are doing down there. Wanted to dive in. We have about a minute and 15 seconds left. Sure the liquor bill and I know it's only a minute and 15 it's hard to get everything but you guys recently just passed out Correct. out a bill just tell us a little bit about what's in the bill and if people are happy or not happy. Uh, Speaker Terzai has offered a bill House bill it was 590 at one point we passed that out of the House over the Senate basically gets government out of the liquor business it is probably one of the top polling things that the average citizen says why is government in this business and when they're polled they say 78 79 percent get out of it the reality is Pennsylvania at one time was making wines, pricing wines, wholesaling wines and liquors, and then also policing it. The government doesn't belong in that business. Uh, you as a consumer have demanded choice in health care, education, and other arrays of life. Why should we be controlling this? We're one of two last states that do this. It's antiquated. It's out of control. And it's also an opportunity for us to sell off those licenses. Uh, there's a one-time hit for some money, but there's also an opportunity in perpetuity to generate additional dollars through private sector growth of new uh, entities that would be doing the function that government should no longer be in. We don't sell tobacco, we don't sell pharmaceuticals, we shouldn't be selling alcohol. I don't think you're selling cars either, red ones, black ones, blue ones, or, or anything like that. Representative Benghoff, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to be, meet with you. My honor. Glad to keep our people informed about what's going on. And thank you for watching WHVL's For the Record at Home. We here always strive to keep you up to date on any of the topics facing the state of Pennsylvania. Have a great day.